Hey everyone, welcome to part 8 of the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. If you are new to the series, we are currently in layer 2 of this massive 1000 plus entry iceberg. I don't want to drag out this intro, so I'll leave a link to the playlist with all of the previous parts down in the description. And as always, if you do end up enjoying the video, simply clicking the like button helps me out tremendously. So without further ado, let's begin. Bell Gunnis, aka Hal's Bell, was a Norwegian-American serial killer that was active between 1884 and 1908 in a number of states such as Illinois and Indiana. It is confirmed that Bell has killed at least 14 people, but some sources report that she may have taken the lives of upwards of 40 people. The majority of her victims were men that she seduced and brought home on the pretense that they would get married. Interestingly enough, Belle supposedly died in a fire in 1908, but it's commonly believed that she faked her own death and her body was never found, so her true fate is unconfirmed. Belle is said to have a very strong build, almost resembling a man, standing at about 5 foot 8 inches and weighing in at around 220 to 250 pounds. While she was in Chicago, Belle worked as a butcher carrying and cutting up animal carcasses until her first marriage in 1884. That first marriage was to a man named Mads Sorensen. The couple purchased insurance policies for both their home as well as their business, which was a small candy store, both of which ultimately burned down. The couple also had children who would both die from inflammation of the large intestine, and the vast majority of investigators and enthusiasts of this case think that it's very, very likely that the two were actually poisoned. And suspiciously, just like with the home and the business, both children were also insured and Bell would claim a hefty check after each of their deaths. As for Bell's husband, Mads, he also purchased life insurance. In fact, he purchased two life insurance policies. On July 30th, 1900, both policies would be active at the exact same time, and right before one could expire, the other one began. So on that day that the policy should have expired, Mads died of a cerebral hemorrhage, and Bell was able to claim checks for both the expiring policy as well as the one that just went live. With the money, Bell would move to Indiana and purchase a pig farm. And as you could probably expect, while in Indiana, Bell married again and most likely killed this husband as well. Bell married a man named Peter Gunnis in 1902 and they would have a daughter together. The infant died of unknown causes while in Bell's care and about 8 months after her death, Peter would also die due to a head injury. Similar to Mads, Peter also had an insurance policy that paid out about $3,000 at the time. When confronted by authorities, Bell reported that Peter had reached for an item high up on a shelf and accidentally knocked over a meat grinder, which ultimately killed him. The coroner did suspect murder, but since there was no actual evidence, Bell was not arrested. It wasn't until 1908 when authorities would finally realize Bell's crimes. In April of that year, Bell's farmhouse that she purchased in Indiana was burned to the ground. In the wreckage, a headless female corpse was found and initially it was thought to be Bell, but now many people believe it to just be one of Bell's victims. After investigating the farm further, authorities found these sort of slumps in the yard and when they dug them up, they found more bodies. After the first two days of digging, body parts belonging to 11 different people would be uncovered and authorities ultimately backtracked on their earlier statement saying the headless woman was Belle. And just as an FYI, most of the bodies that were unearthed were impossible to identify. Bell would cut off the arms and legs at the elbows and knees before burying the bodies, and then for some, she would actually remove their heads as well and then place them in their like groin area. So while Bell was officially pronounced dead, there is a lot of strong evidence that say otherwise. Such as the body that was actually found that was suspected of being Bell was actually much younger than her. And I couldn't really find out how authorities determined this, but they found out that the body that was suspected of being Belle was actually burned after she had died. And those are just some of the aspects people point to when they believe that Belle actually survived or wasn't even part of that fire that day. Most of you have probably heard of Stonehenge before, possibly the world's most famous prehistoric monument that resides in England. 
We don't really know who was responsible for building the monument, but it's estimated to have been built about 5,000 years ago. But today we're not going to talk about that particular monument, but instead the slightly lesser known one that is in Georgia. Some people call this one Doomsday Stonehenge, while others refer to it as the Georgia Guidestones. It is believed that these stones were placed in Georgia in 1979, and on them you'll find eight different modern languages etched into the stones, and then four dead languages. The debates come in when we discuss the purpose of these stones, as well as how exactly we're supposed to be interpreting them. And located on the stones, there are a set of 10 instructions. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Guide reproduction wisely. Unite humanity with a living new language. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. Balance personal rights with social duties. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. And lastly, be not a cancer on the earth, leave room for nature. Now supposedly there is one man in the world who knows who built these stones, but when he was asked as to who it was, he replied with this. They could put a gun to my head and kill me. I will never reveal his real name. Numerous theorists and internet sleuths have put their heads together in order to come up with possible explanations for the stone slabs, but there is no widely agreed upon theory. One theorist suggested that the stones were the beginnings of a totalitarian tribal government, while another was convinced that the stones were satanic and had to be destroyed. The controversial internet personality, Alex Jones, has even come out to give his own opinion. He believes that the stones are related to some sort of culling event for humans. Being that the original Stonehenge monument likely has some sort of astronomical significance, many people also believe that the Georgia Guidestones may have some sort of astronomical use. So with this in mind, several astronomers study the stones and they describe the astronomical features as crude. One astronomer was even quoted saying, this is an abacus to Stonehenge's computer. And unfortunately, earlier last year, the stones were actually destroyed. At first, it was only partially damaged in some sort of blast, but later on, for safety reasons, the entire thing was demolished. So we might never know the true purpose of the Georgia Guidestones. Let me know what you guys think about this monument in the comments. Do you think this was some sort of elaborate art project? Or was there something else going on entirely? Stephen Smith is the name of a 19 year old who mysteriously died in 2015. In South Carolina, Stephen was found on the road, dead from blunt force trauma. The case itself was listed as a hit and run, but no suspects were ever arrested. And with no leads, the case eventually went cold. That was until 2021. Cause the thing about Steven's case is that he may or may not be tied to the infamous Murdoch family. And very quickly, I do want to sidetrack here in order to provide some background info into the Murdochs. So between 1920 and the early 2000s, several Murdoch family members served as district attorneys. The man that we're going to be looking at today is named Richard Murdaugh, often referred to as Alex, and he was often found involved in investigations that included murder, corruption, insurance fraud, and much more. The family was so well known that locals began calling the area Murdaugh County. And eventually, the family founded a nationally recognized law firm in Hampton, South Carolina. In 2019, Alex's son named Paul and others in the family were involved in a fatal boating accident. During this time, Alex was being accused by the public of giving special treatment to his family in legal settings. Then in June 2021, Alex killed both his wife and his son Paul. Additionally, Alex was embezzling money from his law firm that he resigned from in September of 2021. So basically what I want you all to understand is that the family, specifically Alex, were pretty shady people. And from what I gathered from the family's case, their situation and story is quite interesting and I kind of want to do a dedicated video on them, so if that's something you think you'd be interested in, let me know in the comments. Now that we know who the Murdaws are, let's return to Stephen Smith. So as we know, Stephen was killed in a suspected hit and run situation. In 2021, when authorities were investigating Alex Murdaugh's case, they came upon evidence that may suggest that Alex or some member of the Murdaugh family was involved in Stephen's death. 
So now, in case you're wondering how exactly does Steven get tied up with the Murdaws, well, Steven Smith was openly gay, and based on interviews with Steven's high school classmates, he was in touch with Alex's oldest son named Buster. So based on some information that is provided online, some people do believe that the earlier mentioned Paul Murdaugh, who Alex killed, may be responsible for Steven's death. Now why exactly Paul went after Steven, it's unclear. And since this case is unresolved and ongoing, some people think it might be a possibility that Paul is being framed. And others say that since Alex was actually proven to have killed two people, he may even be responsible for Steven's murder. Or at the very least, he may know some very vital information. And similar to the John Bonet Ramsey case in an earlier part of the iceberg, I was told to be kind of careful when talking about this incident. So unfortunately, this is kind of where I have to draw the line on this one. Back in the late 2010s, there was a striking Craigslist post that involved the act of donating blood so that it can be used in a satanic ritual. Supposedly, the group behind this post had taken the lives of 5 people and have received blood from 10 others. In the post, OP also left the full address and time when the ritual was supposed to take place. So when police were notified of this, they decided to pay the address a visit and they actually found 4 men standing over a pentagram of what was later determined to be human blood. Now if you're wondering what about this is a mystery, it's basically the entire event itself. Many people believe this to have been a hoax as the original Craigslist post cannot be found nor any details on the individuals that were arrested. If you simply look up Craigslist satanic ritual, you will come across articles mentioning the Craigslist killer and how they were involved in a satanic cult, but you won't find anything that fits the description that this reddit user gave. On September 6th, 1987, the Playboy channel was hijacked during the airing of a film. During this hijacking, the message that you see on screen was displayed. Thus saith the Lord thy God, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The religious content and the technical clues left behind by the jamming signal led investigators to CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network. Police eventually found a man named Thomas Haney who worked at CBN and arrested him on suspicions that he was involved. The earlier mentioned clues that were left behind allowed for investigators to identify the brand of transmitter used from the video and the engineer on duty at the time of the broadcast was Thomas. Thomas Haney was ultimately convicted of satellite piracy in connection with the hijacking but he did plead innocent. CBN was adamant that the case against Thomas was entirely circumstantial since there weren't any witnesses and the signal couldn't be traced back to an exact point of origin. As part of the investigation, authorities reenacted the incident with CBN's own equipment, but the result was different to the original hijacking. CBN also added that they did not supply Thomas with equipment that was powerful enough to successfully jam Playboy signal in the first place. No footage of the broadcast hijacking has ever resurfaced, and being that there wasn't a large audience viewing the channel at the time, it's unlikely anyone has the footage archived. The Great Library of Alexandria was located in Egypt and was one of the largest and most important libraries from the ancient world. It was estimated at one point that the library even held over half a million documents from a wide array of nations including Greece, India, Persia, and of course Egypt amongst others. The subjects in these books and documents range from law, comedy, poetry, history, medicine, math, science, and much much more. The library acted as a part of one of the largest institutions of higher learning known as the Alexandrian Museum and was often visited by high status scholars. One of the earliest documents that mentions the library suggests that it was founded during the reign of Ptolemy I and was organized by a student of Aristotle named Demetrius who had been exiled from Athens. However, this information should be taken with a grain of salt as it is now known that some pieces of information within this document were confirmed to be inaccurate. When Julius Caesar was in pursuit of Pompey, he was suddenly cut off by Egyptian boats in the harbor of Alexandria. And out of rage, Caesar ordered his men to burn the fleet that was standing in his way and sack the city as well. 
This flame would spread from the harbor to the city and ultimately come into contact with the library. However, the library wasn't completely destroyed and it was actually able to be somewhat salvaged. As time went on, the library would go through a number of additional burnings and attacks which ultimately completely destroyed the library as well as the majority of its contents. Oftentimes, when you look into this topic, you will hear claims such as this library contained all of the knowledge in the world. And while that may be a slight hyperbole, there's no doubt that the destruction of the library was a significant blow to the progression of mankind, setting us back generations. And obviously, we have little to no explicit information on what the actual documents inside the library contained. Diane Suzuki was a 19-year-old student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa that went missing on July 6, 1985. Diane was just under 5 feet tall and weighed about 110 pounds. She was last seen around 3 to 5 p.m. near the Rosalie Woodson Dance Academy where she worked as a dance instructor. And at the time of Diane's disappearance, a string of unsolved murders were also taking place in Oahu. Those murders resulted in the deaths of nine women and many investigators theorized that Diane may have also been a victim of the same killer. After Diane had finished teaching her class on July 6th, she was supposed to meet up with some friends who were waiting to pick her up in the parking lot. Very quickly, they realized that something was not right, as Diane was a very punctual person and if she had to change plans for whatever reason, she definitely would have let her friends know ahead of time. In addition to not finding Diane, the friends noticed that her vehicle was left abandoned in the parking lot with her purse and keys left unattended within the dance academy. Diane was officially reported as missing that same night when the friends contacted authorities. And obviously from there, authorities contacted Diane's parents who immediately arrived at the dance facility. But when they arrived, they saw something kind of suspicious. The parents said they saw three anxious looking people carrying a large trunk out of the building in a hasty manner. Authorities would be able to identify the trio as Dewey Hamasaki and his parents. Dewey was immediately brought in as a person of interest and authorities learned that he was an acquaintance of Diane's and he had a massive crush on the girl. And along Dewey's body and arms, there were numerous scratch marks. Authorities then asked Dewey to take a polygraph test, which he failed. A few years later, Honolulu police would use luminol as part of the investigation. If you are unaware, luminol is a chemical that is basically just used to detect blood. And within the bathroom of the dance academy, they found blood stains in one of the stalls. Police were not able to determine whether or not the blood belonged to Diane though. But as a result of this discovery, police decided to search Hamasaki's home. And I'm not entirely sure why they didn't do this in the first place. On the Hamasaki property, authorities found buried clothing that looked very similar to those that Diane wore the day she went missing. Furthermore, the Hamasakis owned a pig farm and when authorities went to investigate, they found a section of stone wall that seemed to have been recently built. When investigators turned their attention towards it, Dewey's father became extremely agitated. Eventually, when they were able to look behind the wall, they found nothing. And something I'd like to add is that police needed two search warrants to completely fulfill this investigation. And due to this, many people believe that the Hamasakis caught wind of the very first search warrant, so they decided to move Diane's body from out of that stone wall. However, that is just a theory. Investigators would test the soil that was resting beneath that wall and it indicated that it had been built only six months earlier, which is more or less the same amount of time that it took police to get that second search warrant. In 1993, when all of the suspects and all of the results of the investigation were brought in front of the grand jury, the court declined to press charges for lack of damning evidence. In 1997, Diane's parents were sure that she had passed away by then, so they decided to organize a funeral without a body as a last farewell. A year later after the funeral, Diane's mother would pass away. Diane's aging father still lives and he continues to seek answers. As for Dewey, he is now a photographer and he has even published his work in a Christian photography book.
On September 8, 1863, a man was discovered on the beach of Sandy Cove, Nova Scotia. This man had nothing but a tiny bit of water and a meager amount of food set by him. And when you lay eyes on the man, the first thing to catch your attention is likely the absence of his legs. Instead, there were only two short stumps. When locals questioned the man, they learned very little as he seemed to not speak English at all. When he was asked what his name was, he meekly muttered out, Jerome. And so, that's what people called him. George was discovered with bandages wrapped around his stumps by an 8-year-old child named George Albright. Being so young and curious, George ran to the man asking what had happened to him and when the boy got no response, he decided to bring Jerome back home as he was shivering from the cold. When they arrived, George's parents nursed him back to health. When medical professionals took a look at Jerome, they determined that his legs were professionally amputated by a skilled surgeon. After removing the bandages, it was found that Jerome hadn't completely healed yet. While Jerome was lying sick in bed, he was visited by many locals who were eager to learn more about the mysterious man. He was approached by French, Latin, Italian, and Spanish speakers, but he didn't seem to understand any of them. Either that, or he just didn't care to respond. He was reported to have shunned the attention that the onlookers gave him, even going as far as growling at some of the people that visited. Jerome was moved between the locals, house to house, as the Albright family couldn't afford to feed another mouth for very long. Eventually, a group of Baptists decided to send him to a French community as Jerome appeared to be a Catholic. The Nova Scotia government also granted Jerome a special stipend that paid him $2 a week. As Jerome moved around, he eventually ended up in a home near to Metahan. By this time, Jerome had become relatively famous in the area and many people wanted to visit him and possibly speak with him. Due to this fame, the homeowners that Jerome lived with decided to allow the public to see him after they paid an admissions fee. Jerome stayed in this location up until his death in April of 1912. One popular theory suggests that Jerome may have been a sailor who attempted a mutiny and failed, and thus was punished by amputation and left at Sandy Cove. It's also pretty commonly agreed upon that Jerome may have had some sort of brain injury in his past which damaged a part of his brain that regulates speech. Okay, so after I finished researching and recording this entry, I found another article that supposedly solves the mystery of Jerome. According to this article, there was a newspaper clipping that was printed very early in like 2000 or 2001 that stated Jerome was left behind by a ship slash boat. It said that Jerome used to work at a lumber company in New Brunswick and one night in the middle of winter, he got lost. And as he searched for a path back home, he fell down between the logs of a mill pond. Still lost, Jerome wandered into a sawmill where he decided he would just fall asleep. Keep in mind, this was in the middle of winter and the weather was absolutely terrible. When Jerome woke up, his legs were completely frozen. He screamed out for help and eventually some people would find him and bring back a surgeon. The surgeon stated that his legs were too badly damaged from the cold and he had to immediately amputate both of them above the knee. Jerome's employer feared that he would blame the company for this accident, so he approached a small fisherman and requested that he take Jerome and quote unquote dispose of him. And this is how Jerome was left at Sandy Cove. And another detail that I didn't learn until recently is that when Jerome was questioned as to how he lost his legs, he said the word cool, which could support this previous account of events. Indrid Cold aka The Smiling Man is a pretty famous entity in American folklore that can be traced back to around the 1960s. Obviously, Cold is human-like in appearance, but he is commonly believed to be an alien or have extraterrestrial ties. Cold is also 6 feet tall with slicked back hair and is oftentimes wearing some sort of reflective suit. But his most defining feature is his freakish ear-to-ear -ear smile. In November of 1966, in Parkersburg, West Virginia, a man named Woodrow Derenberger was on his way home on Interstate 77 until he heard a loud crash. Woodrow said that at this moment, some large unidentified vehicle appeared in front of his truck. He described the vehicle as a sort of lamp slash chimney, but both ends of it flared out, and in the center there was a large bulge. 
After a few seconds, Indrid Cold stepped out of the vehicle and walked up to Woodrow where he then telepathically told him his name. Cold also added that he wasn't there to hurt humans but to simply learn more about them. It should also be noted that Indrid Cold sightings began coming out around the same time that the Mothman gained widespread attention. Gustav is the name given to a large Nile crocodile in Burundi who's notorious for eating humans and is rumored to have killed over 200 people. It's said that Gustav mainly roams between the banks of the Ruzizi River and the northern shores of Lake Tanganyika. Amongst the locals, Gustav has reached near mythical status and is immensely feared by the people of the region. Since he's never been caught, his exact length and weight are unknown, but it's estimated he could easily pass 20 feet or 6.1 meters in length and weigh upwards of 2,000 pounds or about 900 kilograms. And due to his incredible size, many believe that Gustav must have been alive for at least 100 years. However, in one observational study on the animal, it was revealed that the croc still had a near full set of teeth, which more or less disproves the notion that Gustav is 100 years old. Instead, it's more likely that a crocodile is around six decades in age and may still be growing. If one actually came face to face with this beast, they'd notice the three bullet scars running along his body as well as a deep scar in his right shoulder blade. According to several expert herpetologists, Gustav may have been exceedingly larger than he should have been at a younger age and due to this, he was unable to hunt for fish. So instead, Gustav was forced to attack much larger, slower moving animals such as buffalo, hippos, and of course, humans. One thing leads to another and these larger food sources just added to his already massive physique. It's also been mentioned a couple of times that Gustav doesn't finish consuming the corpses of his victims but instead just abandons them halfway through eating. Now where the mystery in this entry lies is in the whereabouts of Gustav and it's not 100% confirmed that Gustav is the single crocodile to blame for all the damage that's being caused in the area. Apparently the crocodile hasn't been seen since around 2009 to 2010. In 2019, there was an article in a Burundi travel guide that mentioned Gustav and how he was killed, but many critics say that this is a false claim as there is no evidence in general to support it, let alone photographic evidence. John Doe number 24 is a name given to a deaf and blind man from Jacksonville, Illinois who was put into a mental facility in the 1940s as a teen. He spent 30 years at the Lincoln Development Center before being transferred several times which ended up leaving him in a senior center in Peoria, Illinois and he did die in 1993 at the age of 64. The earliest documents on the John Doe said that a pair of police officers found a black teenager suspiciously wandering around Jacksonville in October of 1945. The officers quickly realized that the boy was deaf and incapable of communicating. When they asked him why he was wandering the streets, he simply wrote Lewis, which many investigators believed to be his name. However, this would be all that they could learn as no additional information could be found out about him. With nowhere else to go, the judge placed the young man into the mental health system where he got his name, John Doe number 24. In 1978, he was given a legal name of John Doe Boyd so that he could apply for social security. And oftentimes when this topic is brought up, it brings along a level of frustration because he was always referred to as John Doe instead of the name Lewis which most people suspected of being his real name. Kirsty Bentley was a teenager from Ashburton, New Zealand who went missing in late December of 1998 while walking the family dog. Her body was found in some shrubs about 25 miles away from her hometown. Kirsty was born on January 18, 1983 and was the second of two children in the family. Kirsty's mother described her as a vibrant, energetic, and compassionate kid but did have troubles opening up to new people. On the day of her disappearance, Kirsty met up with a friend at the Ashburton Library at about 10.30 a.m. The two would embark on a shopping trip before stopping at a McDonald's to eat and rest and by now the time was around 12 p.m. A couple hours later, Kirsty's friend's sister met up with the two so Kirsty could be dropped off back home. Once Kirsty returned home, she tried calling her boyfriend around 2.40 p.m. but no one picked up. 
And so she decided to take the family's black lab out for a walk before trying for another call. And it was from here that no one knows what exactly happened to Kirsty. When Kirsty initially returned home after spending time with her friend, her brother John was upstairs, but he was unaware that Kirsty had come home at all. When the children's mother, whose name is Jill, came home, they immediately called Kirsty's boyfriend to check if she was with him or if he knew where she was, but the boyfriend said he had no idea where Kirsty had gone. John left the house to search the immediate vicinity, but found no trace of Kirsty. About an hour after the search, the father whose name is Sydney also returned home and when he learned about his missing daughter, he contacted the police. The search effort rapidly began to grow after police got involved, but after hours of searching from police, family, friends, and search dogs, nothing was found. The next day, around 10 a.m., the family dog that Kirsty had taken out for a walk was found tied to a tree beside the Ashburton River. Now, this area was searched the previous day in the initial search effort, but somehow they didn't come across the dog. This could either mean that the dog was only semi-recently left by the tree or it was hidden in all of the foliage, which is a bit unlikely as the dog likely would have been making significant noise at the time. The police gave the area where the dog was found a deeper search and found some items belonging to Kirsty. Those items were her shorts and her underwear. Again, when Kirsty went missing, it was already really late into December and it wasn't until the 17th of January when her body was discovered. Two hikers who were in the Camp Goli area of Rakaya, which is about 25 miles from Ashburton, found what was described as a lump of mass emanating a terrible smell. This turned out to be the badly decomposed body of Kirsty, who was lying in a patch of overgrown shrubs with a thin layer of branches and leaves covering her. Kirsty's body was left in a fetal position, partially clothed. The area where Kirsty was found is a known location for illegal cannabis growers and the two men who discovered the girl's body were reluctant to contact police at first, but thankfully they realized that this was too important to not report. Medical officials determined that Kirsty died from blunt force trauma to the right side of the back of her head. In fact, the pathologist said that this hit was so strong that Kirsty would have died shortly after she was wounded. Additionally, after examining the state of the body and the stomach contents, it's believed that Kirsty was killed soon after she went missing and that it's likely that she was placed in the Camp Gully area that same night. Hundreds upon hundreds of suspects were brought to the police's attention and apparently even to this day, there are several hundred people who have not been formally eliminated from investigation yet. Two of the immediate suspects were Kirsty's father and brother. Of course, both denied any involvement. Kirsty's father, Sid, couldn't provide a strong alibi as to where he was when Kirsty first disappeared. At first, he claimed to be in a neighboring town, but later changed that statement to him hitting his head and instead he was still in Ashburton that entire day. But he wouldn't go into specifics as to where he was, stating that he was too embarrassed to admit what he was doing. In 2018, police confirmed that they no longer believed that John or Sid were involved in Kirsty's death. And in case you're wondering, Kirsty's boyfriend at the time has also been eliminated from the possibility of being the culprit. It was later revealed by a bystander that when Kirsty went missing, a van was seen nearby her last known location when she went out for a walk. This van was a 1961 Commer van that was set up to act as a camper. The van itself was quite rare, having fewer than three vehicles matching its description ever in New Zealand. Dozens of people came forward with sightings to the police, but all were discounted as the vehicle police were looking for was very distinct and the descriptions given to them did not fit. The van has never been found and no leads were ever revealed. The Lane Bryant shooting was an armed robbery at a Lane Bryant clothing outlet in Illinois that resulted in five deaths and one injury. The shooting took place on February 2nd, 2008, and to this day, the shooter remains unknown. On that day, a man posing as a delivery driver entered the Lane Bryant store and pulled out a firearm. From there, he forced four customers, a part-time employee, and the store manager into the back room and shot all of them. After police consulted the surviving victim, this was the composite sketch they came up with. The gunman was described as being a black male with thick cornrowed hair. He was also between 6 and 6 feet 2 inches tall and aged in his late 20s to mid 30s at the time of the crime. 
When police arrived, they closed and locked down the shopping center while searching the vicinity, but they couldn't find the culprit or any clues. And from what I heard, that Lane Bryant store never reopened and it was actually torn down and a TJ Maxx was built on top of that property. The motive for the crime is undetermined, as the store didn't carry very much cash and there were many other locations that would have gave him more. So that is going to end off the video. As always, thank you so much if you made it this far. And if you did enjoy the video, leaving a like would really help me out. And I think for the next like two weeks or so, I'm going to take a break from the iceberg, not from uploading, because there have been a few incidents that I've come across that aren't necessarily from the iceberg itself, but I've come across them through like YouTube and just other articles. But I found them quite interesting as well as just disturbing and despicable in some cases. So you have those to look forward to in the coming weeks. If you've been keeping up with me on my community tab, uh, you guys kind of know what topics are coming up. And overall, I just think this is going to be a healthy change of pace from the 40 to one hour long videos that I try to do every week. Uh, unfortunately, I've been kind of slacking, not necessarily slacking, but just been overall um, a bit too busy to put out those hour-long iceberg videos, which I really want to do, but, but I think just cutting the duration of the videos down is just going to be an overall healthier option in the long run because I do want to put out videos every week. So with all that being said, thanks again for watching the video and sticking to the end, and I'll talk to you all again very soon.